So here's where we start. Coming on the heels of a message like last week can be a difficult thing to do because last week was all about Jesus and we were excited to talk about Jesus. The Holy Spirit was moving in this place. I know it's a Baptist church, but still, uh, the Spirit was here and with us as we study through the, the Word of God. Uh, and, and so it can be a difficult thing to do, especially coming off of a, what we might call a, a spiritual high like that, and then to delve back into the depths of the Word. But and if you remember, when we began studying Galatians chapter 3, the way that Paul starts that is by appealing to the Galatians' experience. He says, you should know that you are saved beyond any question because of your experience. But your experience is not all in all. And it's the same thing in church. Just because you feel church last week and don't feel church this week, or if you do, that's great. But even if you don't, we're still studying the same Word of God, still has the same powerful effects. You just have to apply it to your life. So I hope that that's what you came here prepared to do this morning. Because from that point onward, for three weeks' time, after looking at the experience, we began looking at the Scripture, and Paul constantly pointing to the Old Testament Scriptures, showing us the realities from the Gospel all the way back in the Old Testament. And the first reality of that Gospel, you remember, is that everybody sins. And as a result, everyone is cursed. Everybody breaks God's law. Every person who is living today who has ever lived and who will ever live, falls into this category. We're all guilty. We're all condemned. We're all under divine judgment and on our way to an eternal separation from God in a, in a fiery hell if we do not escape through salvation. But the good news of the gospel is that God is also a God of incomprehensible and unfathomable blessing. He's not only willing to forgive, but he's eager to forgive. He's ready to do it now. And so we are told by the scripture that the only way to escape from under that curse and escape into blessing is through Jesus the Christ. We studied last week who became sin on our behalf. And we talked a little bit about what that meant. This idea of imputation. The fact that God in Christ imputed our sin onto him and therefore reckoned us righteousness by imputing Christ's righteousness to us. And therefore he could justify the wicked and condemn the righteous and still remain both the just and the justifier, uh, to use the language of Romans. So Paul has shown the Galatians that salvation is by faith alone, first of all through their own experience, but now through Scripture, beginning all the way back with the patriarch Abraham. So if you would, go ahead and begin turning with me to the chapter that we've been in for a while now, Galatians chapter number 3. We're going to be looking today at verses 15 through 22, beginning in Galatians chapter 3, reading down through verse 22. When you're there, say, I'm there. You guys are either getting really good or I'm becoming really predictable. <laughs> beginning in verse number 15, reading down through verse 22, this is the word of the Lord. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. What I am saying is this, so Paul breaks it down for us. What I am saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of promise. Verse 19, the great question. Why the law then? Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Paul answers his own question. May it never be. God forbid. For if the law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Amen. 
Let's go to the word of the Lord in prayer. Lord, I come before you humbly and honest this morning, knowing that on my own I am completely and totally incapable of taking this word and finding a way to make it palatable to those that are in attendance here today. But I know that you can. And I am counting on that in this very moment. I ask that you would show us your promise and show us that it is always greater than the law, that it is always greater than ourselves to show us the reality that in Christ Jesus today, the promise is better than the law. I ask as always that you would remove me, God, and instead fill me with the words that you would have your people to hear. Use me, God, as a willing vessel made of clay and of wood, not fitting to take this pulpit, but, Lord, that your word may go forth and impact the lives that you would have it impact today. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen and Amen. In the remainder of chapter number 3, Paul turns his attention, uh, really going through chapter 4, toward the objections that might come up as a result of what he's just proclaimed in verses 6 through 14. This argument that through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, which is being written and penned as Paul is writing right now, this idea that salvation and justification before God comes in faith and faith alone. So Paul here is answering the strongest objections that may come up as a result of this. So you would have these Judaizers, who may say, you know what, Paul? What you're saying makes a lot of sense. That's fair. That is fair. Abraham and his pre-Sinai descendants, they were saved by faith. Why? Because there was no law. So you know what, Paul? We will grant you that. Yes, faith is how you were justified before God, before the law. But surely those after Moses, surely those after the law, were saved by adherence to the law. Have you ever argued like that? Somebody comes up and says, well, what about God in the Old Testament doing all of that killing, right? God declaring all of these nations anathema. God uh, wiping out the Moabites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Mosquito Bites, and he's tearing them all down, all of the kingdoms. Have you ever argued and said, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of wrath. That's the God of judgment. God of righteousness. Most people, that's how they respond. Most people that have been church, that's how they respond. That's the old covenant. That's the way God was in the old covenant. But now there is a new covenant through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that seems like a reasonable argument, right? It's because it is a reasonable argument. It is a reasonable argument. We don't obey the law because Christ fulfilled the law. Right? Right? It's the same argument that the Judaizers are using. Makes sense to me. And so what Paul is doing is he's anticipating the strongest objections from his opponent, and then he's going to show them why they're wrong. He's going to cut it off at the pass before they ever make that objection. You have to remember here, Paul is writing. He's writing a letter. He's not speaking with them face to face. He's not debating them face to face. And so he's having in his mind to think, well, what is the strongest objection that they can bring against me? And how can I, through Christ, eradicate that? That is the way that we as Christians need to think. What is the strongest objection to Christianity and how can I cut it down? Because far too often what we do is we do what's called a straw man fallacy. How many of you have ever heard that term before? Straw man fallacy. What that means is that you build a straw man. You misrepresent your opponent's objections. You misrepresent your opponent's argument, and as such, you tear that down. It's like a straw man. You set him on fire, he just burns. You cut him, he just goes down. You don't actually tackle the strongest objection. What you do is tackle what you have answers for before you so that you don't have to dig in and do any more studying. Paul says that does not measure up. I'm going to tackle the strongest objections from my opponent, cut it down, before it ever gets the opportunity to flourish. So their argument would have been simple. The Mosaic Covenant supplanted or took over the Abrahamic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant was given after the Abrahamic Covenant. 
And therefore, law overtook faith. Does everybody understand how the Judaizers got to that point? It's a logical step. They're not doing anything that's out of the ordinary. They're using their own minds, but they're focusing on things below instead of on things that are above. They're missing out on the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, and instead moving forward with human wisdom. Their argument would have been the covenant with Abraham held off the wrath of God until the law came. But now, now that the law has been given, God requires obedience to that law. God requires circumcision. God requires rites and rituals and practices therein. That has overtaken, that has supplanted the previous covenant. And so what Paul does in these verses is answer that objection by showing that God's covenant is a covenant of promise to Abraham. And he shows that it was a covenant of promise to Abraham that was unconditional. Do you remember when we studied that, what we said unconditional was? It remains in full force and effect, and the only thing it is dependent upon is God. Is God and God alone. You see, the promise to Abraham was unconditional, meaning without restraints, including the restraint of time. That's what was bothering the Judaizers. Including the restraint of time. It was a promise where God continually told Abraham, I will, I will, I will. And we studied this covenant at great lengths if you were with us in our His Story Revealed series. If you weren't, you can go back and watch that on YouTube. But you will recall that God, over and over and over again, this covenant says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will, I will, I will. The promise dependent solely upon God and his sovereign grace and initiative. All Abraham had to do then was to have faith, was to trust in God. But the Mosaic covenant, on the other hand, was dependent upon man's being able to obey the law. We all know how well that worked, don't we? Yeah, I hope that you see the difference here. One is fully dependent on God. The other one is fully and completely dependent upon man. God's promise to Abraham was, I will. God's covenant through the law was, thou shall, or in most cases, thou shalt not. If you're reading the old King Jimmy version of the text. Abraham's covenant naturally led to a religion of faith. It was a covenant of promise. It was a covenant of reliance and complete dependence upon God. Whereas the covenant of the law, or the covenant of Moses, naturally led to a religion of law. A religion of dependence upon man's actions and ability and behavior and obedience. Not only obedience, but perfect obedience to appease a perfect God. And so what Paul does here is he takes the covenant of the promise in verses 15 through 22, and he juxtaposes that to the covenant of the law. That is what these verses are dealing with. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how far that we'll get today because of time constraints, but we're going to begin by talking about the promise. And then if we have time, we'll jump into the law, and if not, we'll save that for next week. But you'll notice that in the next few verses, the verses 15 through 18, you have this word promise that appears six times within the text. It actually appears six times in verses 15 through 22. But it is a very key word in this passage, promise promise. We typically like the word promise, don't we? I mean, when you think about the word promise, it's a, it's a good word. It's a noble word. It's a just word. It's filled with hopeful realities of what could be. It has a type of goodness built into it. I think of the marriage ceremony and all the language of promise and of covenant and of bonds and of vows and other such words that comes to mind. When you think of the word promise, it speaks to a commitment for a better and brighter future ahead. And this word promise, and its closest counterpart in the Bible, which is covenant, is use of an action. An action which God performs. God cuts covenants. God keeps promises. And when God is the one making the covenant, you can always find three things. I want you to write these down if you have a pen and a piece of paper or a pencil and a piece of paper. First of all, they are always divine. 
They're always divine, meaning that they come from God alone. They are divine. They are unconditional because they're not dependent on anything or anyone outside of God and God alone. Secondly, they are eternal. What does that mean? They continue forever. They are eternal and continue forever and therefore are incapable of being broken, supplanted, or overtaken. Does that make sense? If it goes into eternity, can it be overtaken? No. And thirdly, they are offered in grace. What does that mean? It means that the recipient is never deserving. The recipient is never deserving. So they are always divine, eternal, and gracious. And what that means is that a covenant that God cuts is far superior to any covenant that is lacking those attributes. That is lacking God and God alone being the cutter and the keeper of that covenant. So with that in mind, let's first take a look at what Paul says about the superior nature of the promise as opposed to the law. He says the covenant of promise is superior to the covenant of law, first of all, because of what you see on the screen. The confirmation of the promise. If you have a bulletin, it will be on the back of your bulletin as well. You'll see four things. This first one comes from verse 15. Verse 15 illustrates the superiority by comparing the covenant of God to the covenant of the law. He writes, Brethren, or brothers, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, the argument here is from the lesser to the greater. How many of you would argue that a covenant between people is lesser than a covenant between God? Is there anybody that would argue otherwise? No. So this here is an argument from the lesser to the greater. Human covenants are less than divine covenants. But even when we as humans make covenants or promises, they are made with the understanding that they are not to be broken or they are not to be trampled underfoot. And if that's not enough, Paul says that once they are ratified, this word is a legal term, meaning once they are sworn to and subscribed in the presence of others, no one sets it aside, no one adds further conditions to it. Now that is a magnificent teaching as to the power of your words when you make a promise or a commitment. Why? Because we are image bearers of God. And one of the ways that we bear the image of God is through the ability to keep our word. I think of the divorce rate in this country. And the fact that right now as it stands, the last numbers I saw, 52% of marriages end in divorce. 52%. Of people who say, I promise and I commit myself to you. Break that promise. Break that commitment. That is not an insignificant statistic. Is it? 52%. The vast majority. It's sad. It's sad. You see, when God spoke, creation came into existence. God's word is what brought forth life and abundance, and creation, and the sustainment of that creation, even to this very day. And as image bearers of God, when we speak words of promise, or words of covenant, or words of commitment, we are to uphold, and we are to maintain those to the best of our ability. Church, if you make promises without the intention of keeping them, that is evil. In effect, you are saying, I, as an image bearer of God, represent that God can make a promise and not keep it. And therefore, what does that mean for your salvation? It's serious. I'm telling you, this is damning heretical stuff. And we just breeze through it when we read through the scripture. It amazes me. It absolutely amazes me. The Bible says very plainly, let your yes be what, church? Yes. And your no be no, if you have no intentions of upkeeping a promise, you know what you should say instead? No, just say no. You can't be everything to all people, amen? amen? Promises are not to be taken lightly. They're not to be made on a whim. If you remember when we were discussing the covenant with Abraham, God continually promises, I will, I will, I will. And Abram, he wasn't even Abraham yet, 
at this point, said, how can I know that what you say will happen? Could you imagine talking to God like that? God says, I will. And you look at him and say, well, how? How do I know? How do I know that such could be the case? Now, remember, Abraham didn't have the Old and the New Testament. He was living in it. So maybe there was a greater measure of forgiveness than there would be on our parts. But I just, at that point, I just think of God having the opportunity to look back at Abraham and go, Psh, I made you. You came from dirt. How dare you? How dare? But far too often we just question God. We talk back to God. We throw our hands up at God and pray to our rooms and slam the door in God's face. It's a shame. It's a tragedy, a travesty. How can I know that what you say will happen? In other words, how can I be sure that you have every intention of upholding that promise? And God does something amazing if you remember back in this chapter. On God's instruction, Abram divides a heifer, a nanny goat, a ram sheep, a turtle dove, and a pigeon into halves. He cuts them into halves, and then he spreads those halves opposite one another. But then something incredible happens. A deep sleep falls over Abraham. He falls asleep. And while Abram is asleep, the Lord God passes through the path in between. This is Genesis 15, if you remember. The Lord God passes through the path that is in between as, in appearance as a smoking oven and a flaming torch. And we read this. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Now, ordinarily, when parties cut a covenant, both parties had to walk through. Both parties had to walk through those slain carcasses in effect to say, if I break this promise, this is what's going to happen to me. Serious. It's serious stuff. I wish we took it more seriously today. But in this case, it was God alone who passed through. Why? What does that show us? Because the covenant was completely dependent upon God. It was not dependent upon Abraham. God said, I will, I will, I will. The covenant completely unilateral, completely unconditional, as God was the only obligated party. He is the one that made the promise. He is the one that would fulfill it in order to glorify his nature and his name, which we've studied on and on, so I won't talk about that. So let's go back to Paul's argument for a second. If man's covenant, once it's ratified, cannot be overruled, set aside, or stipulated after the fact, that's the lesser argument, then he asks the question, how much less can a covenant made with the eternal God be separated, set aside, or overruled when he has made it with himself. Do you see that argument? From the lesser to the greater. Therefore, Paul concludes that God's covenant with Moses is a conditional covenant, by the way. The covenant of the law was a conditional covenant. Why? God gave the law, but who had to upkeep the law? Who had to follow the law? It was dependent upon man's obedience. It was dependent upon man's actions. And more than that, it was dependent upon man's intentions, which is something that we talk about often here. And so God's covenant to Abraham was greater, superior, because by its nature it was permanent and it was unchanging. And the reason we know this is because of the confirmation of the... Of the slow down, son. The confirmation of the promise. It was confirmed by God and by God alone as he was the one that walked through, passed through the carcasses and said, this will be me if this covenant is ever broken. That's powerful stuff. God is not going to break his covenant. Amen? Amen. That's good news. That's shouting grounds, church. Secondly, the promise is superior to the covenant of the law because of Christ who is the center of the promise. Now, if you're puzzled about this heading, you're definitely thinking logically. How could Christ be the center of a promise to Abraham all the way back in Genesis when Christ doesn't appear on the scene until the Gospel of Matthew, right? That's the first book in the Bible that Jesus appears in, and we know him as Jesus. So how is Christ the center of the promise all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham, and how many of you think that Abraham had knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord? No. No. He had no, no knowledge of Christ as the central focus 
of the promise. And so what Paul does here is he takes Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, and he exegetes that for us. Do you know what exegete means? It means he exposes the meaning of the text. That's what I do up here every Sunday. I try to make it, put it into plain layman's terms so that everybody under the sound of my voice can understand it. That's what Paul is doing here. He takes Genesis 22, 18, and he expounds upon that scripture, the true meaning of the text, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we read in verse 16, this is what it says. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And here's where the exegesis comes in. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. So here's the thought. The argument would be Abraham had no knowledge of Jesus. Remember, Paul is confronting the strongest objections that can uh, come against him. They had no knowledge of Jesus. How then can this great promise of Genesis chapter 22 to the Christ uh, or apply to the Christ thousands and thousands and thousands of years later? Paul says that's a great question. And his answer is this. You are correct. You are correct. Abraham did not know Jesus. But you know what Abraham did have? What I just wrote to you about in verses 6 through 14. Faith. Faith. Follow me on this, church. He had faith in the immutability or the unchanging nature of God. He had faith in a God-focused and God-centered trust in the Lord. But in the New Testament, we know that Jesus the Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that covenant. So the covenant is still God-focused. The covenant is still God-centered. The, the covenant is still God-oriented because Jesus is God revealed to us more specifically in the New Testament. Now, how many of you heads are spinning? Because that's kind of deep. That's kind of a lot to just chew over, to meditate on. So you may need to go back and do some study on this. So what this means then is that the covenant of the law could not have been interrupted, could not have been modified because the covenant of the promise was permanent in its nature because it hung in the person, Christ. It rests in the permanency of God and that person that would later be revealed to us as the second part of the triune nature of God, the Son, the Christ. Now that's a lot, right? Let's break it down a little bit further. Just like the English word seed, seed, both the Greek and the Hebrew words can be singular or plural. I have a single seed, same word as the word I have many different types of seed, the plural. I have one seed, I have a whole bag of seed. So how could Paul know that when he said seed, all the way back in Genesis 22, that he was referring to the singular seed? How is the only way that Paul could have known that? God. As if God had revealed that to him. You see, Paul knew this through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I would take it a step further, inspiration through the Holy Spirit because he was a man steeped in the Word of God, in the Scripture. He knew there were places in his Bible, which is the Old Testament, where this word, seed, referred to a singular person. Do you need some help? Okay. Where it referred to a singular person, such as Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Genesis chapter 4, Cain has just slain his brother Abel. And God granted Abraham another son named Seth. To which the Bible says, God has appointed to me another seed, another son, in the place of Abel. It refers to a single seed in Genesis 16, verse 11. It is another son, this time Ishmael. It refers to a single seed, this time another son, in 1 Samuel 1, verse 11. This is Samuel. It refers to a single seed, another son, this time Solomon. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Do I need to go on or you got the picture? So it is possible. It is possible. While it can refer to either the singular or the plural, God interpreting his own word through the Apostle Paul, which is what I can only pray happens here 
to us on Sunday morning. In fact, it was my prayer this morning. It's weighed heavily on my heart for weeks now. If you were on Facebook this morning, you would have seen that I even put a post out about this. I said, pastors, as you go about your day, let God's word be the word that goes forth and not yours. You know why? Because souls are too precious. Amen. Time is too short and hell is too hot for us to do anything less but to proclaim the undisputed, unrivaled, unmatched word of the Lord from the pulpit. So God, interpreting his own word through the Apostle Paul, says it was definitely a reference to the singular. By the way, this is not the first time we see this reference to the seed referring to Christ. You can look all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, where God says, I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So here's Paul's point. The only heir of every single one of God's promises is Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Every promise given to Abraham was fulfilled in Christ and only in and through Christ. Therefore, if you want to be a participant in that promise, your center of your faith must be in Christ the same as Abraham, whether he knew it or not. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, you need to tell me it doesn't make sense, or else I'm just going to assume that it makes sense. We'll keep on going. Salvation only comes through faith. Amen. Salvation only comes through faith in the finished work of the cross. For all of those in the Old Testament, it was a faith that looked forward to the cross. It was a faith that looked forward in anticipation of what God was going to do in, through, and beyond the cross of Calvary. But for those of us in the New Testament church, it is a faith that points backward to the cross. We look backward to what Christ has already accomplished, but it is also a faith of hope because we also look forward to the coming of Christ one day. Hopefully you're all able to pray as John does at the end of the book of Revelation. Even so, Lord, come. Even so, Lord, come quickly. There has never been, nor will there ever be, salvation apart from the finished work of Christ. So I'll conclude this second point by saying not only is the covenant of promise greater than the covenant of law because it was confirmed by God, but also because it was centered on Christ alone. Two tremendous realities. Thirdly, the promise of God is superior to the covenant of the law because of the chronology of the promise. How many of you know what chronology means? Time. We're talking about time. This point is simple and straightforward. So if you've tuned out, you can tune back in and everybody can understand this point. And really, you only need one of these points. Paul is writing to undercut all of these objections. But any one of these objections is good enough. So this one is fairly simple. This one is fairly straightforward. Regardless, I want you to be well prepared when you're asked for the reason for the hope that is within you. I want you to have an answer or maybe even multiple answers when somebody asks you for the hope that is within you. So Paul now points to chronology or simply the timeline of the promise. Look with me, if you will, at verse 17. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The covenant was confirmed by God, ratified by God, long before the covenant of the law came onto the scene. Because the covenant with Abraham was unconditional, that meant that not even a span of time could overturn it, not even 430 years. How many of you think the promises you make today will be established in 430 years? Time is the great equalizer, folks. If you don't believe it, just have kids. And you watch them. And they grow so quickly. And they grow so fast. And they mature so fast. You know, I, I think of, of dear Maddox and how mature he is for his age. I think of Addie and how grown she is for her age. I think of little Millie and the fact that she already wants to sit up by herself. She already is trying to stand up by herself. She's already trying to hold 
her bottle by herself. And I'm like, time, slow down. You are a thief, but time is a great equalizer. Time continues to march on. Try to stop it sometime. Try to stop it sometime. Try to turn it back sometime. 430 years is a long time. And that number, 430, comes from the last statement of the covenant to Abraham or the promise to Abraham toward the giving of the law to Moses. Again, it is the last statement or reiteration of the covenant because if you're a serious Bible scholar, you'll know that it's not the first because God repeated the covenant of Abraham to his son Isaac and then again to his son Jacob or Israel. You'll see this in Genesis 26, verse 24, and Genesis 28, verse 15. So the time between the first iteration of the promise and the first iteration of the law was 645 years. But the time between the first iteration of the promise and the last iteration of the promise was 215 years. The difference between 645 and 215, you guessed it, 430 years. And the passage of temporal time to an eternal God does not shake his promises. That's an amen point. The promises of an eternal God are not shaken by temporal time. Just that thought alone gives me the goosebumps or the chicken skin or the wet willies or whatever you call it. Nothing is catching God off guard. Think about that. Nothing is catching God off guard. Nothing is thwarting his plan. Nothing will overcome your salvation if you are found in him and are a partaker of this promise. It's beautiful. It's a magnificent reality. And that's the last point. The last point is that the promise is superior to the law because the promise is complete. The promise is complete. It points to the completeness of the promise. What do I mean by complete? Let's look at verse 18 together. For if the inheritance is based on law, if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. Does that make sense? If it's based on law, it is no longer based on promise. Paul has just written in verse number 12 that faith is not of law. Law is not of faith. The two are mutually exclusive. And so he continues and he says, If the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise. But God, I love that, but God. Anytime you see it in the Bible, you need to know what comes after it. But God granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Here's the idea of completeness that I want you to understand in this verse. If the inheritance, what is the inheritance? Salvation, Salvation the blessing of Abraham. In the context, to use the words of Paul, in this passage of Scripture, the blessing of Abraham. Remember back to verse number 9. If the inheritance, if the blessing of Abraham is predicated upon law, based upon law, then it is now based upon man's performance. We've said that time and time and time again. That was Paul's whole point. In verses 6 through 14, you cannot do it on your own. If you try, you will fail. If you try, you are cursed. That was his point. But the inheritance granted to Abraham was granted based on the promise of God and therefore is not dependent upon your expectations, upon your keeping the law, upon your ability to try and merit your salvation or earn your salvation, but it is dependent upon God's power. Folks, the answer of the question is simple. Would you rather rely upon yourself or upon God? Which one? God, right? Is there anybody in the church today that wants to say, I'd rather rely on myself than God? We say that we want to rely on God's power, but then we walk out of those doors and we rely on our own. Just let it sit. You say that you would rather rely on the power of God. The power that spoke and creation came into existence. The power that slayed the lamb before the foundation of the world. 
The power of God that took a dead man in a grave and rose that body to newness of life, whereby that body could go through walls, whereby that body could still be recognized, and whereby that body could ascend to the right hand of the Father, glorifying himself with the same glory that he had beforehand. You are relying on that power. Or are you relying on your own? What have you done compared to God? And I do that, and I do not mean, I mean that humbly, I do not mean that as a chastisement. Please understand that. But what have you done that does not pale in comparison to God Almighty? That's the point. That is the point. The best way that I can help you understand this verse is by looking at, at two words in the Greek. The first is based on, and the second one is granted. Do you see that in the text? where Paul is talking here about based on, based on, granted. In the King James Version, it's be of and gave instead of based on and granted. So here's the idea. If your pay, if your wage is based upon your performance, follow me on this thought. If your pay is based on your performance, the higher you perform, the more or less you make, church. The more you make. The higher the performance, the more you make. Everybody tracking so far. Let's flip it. The lower your performance, the more or less you make. Less. Everybody understands what we're talking about here. Higher performance, more pay. Lower performance, lower pay. If the blessing of God is predicated on your efforts, then it is a wage statement. It is a works statement. That is what Paul has been saying is not the case since Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 1. If you do not get that to this point, you are bewitched from experiencing the gospel, as we talked about a few uh, sermons ago. If the blessing of God is predicated on your efforts, on your wage, on your work, then the best that you deserve... The highest wage you will ever receive, the greatest reward that you will get is eternal separation from God and a hell prepared for the adversary and for his enemies. Folks, it was not prepared for you and me. Amen? God is not trying to send people to hell. People are choosing to reject God. And we forget that sometimes. People's choices have consequences. Choices have consequences consequences. Not everything falls on God. You can't blame everything for, on God, people. Amen or on me? Amen. It's that simple. That's what based on means. But granted, on the other hand, translates a word which means to give graciously, to give liberally, to give open-handedly. It's the same word that the physician Luke uses to describe when the Lord Jesus Christ gave sight to the blind. Was there anything that the blind could do to fix their sight? For if they could, they would not be blind. Amen? There was nothing that they could do but God. But God. It is used in the parable of the debtors who owed money to the lender, but the lender forgave the debts. Was there anything that the debtors could do to make sure their debt was forgiven? Forgiven. No. They could pay off their debt, but that, that is not the same thing as forgiveness. Forgiveness is wiped clean, still owing. It is that same word that is used by the physician. It is the same word used of God's, get this, God's granting the Holy Spirit in the upper room to the disciples. Freely, liberally, completely. Folks, the Holy Spirit is a person. And this comes from Dr. Foy Bennett. I want it ingrained in memory uh, uh, on the video because he said it so many times. The Holy Spirit is a person. And a person cannot be divided into portions or parts. You either have him or you don't have him. Thank you, brother. It is fundamentally different because, get this, church, you and I cannot succeed in keeping the covenant of the law. But on the contrary, God cannot fail 
in upholding the promise. Do you need that one again, or can you remember that? The promise is already made, already cut, already complete. Christ has already been slain, by the way, from the foundation of the world. Right? That is why the promise is infinitely better. It's infinitely better because, first of all, it is confirmed by God. He will not turn his back on you. Amen? It is better than the covenant of the law because it is Christ centered. What does that mean? It means that the Son is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise and therefore the grantor of life through that promise. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am by God the life. And no man comes to the Father. No man gets to have life. No man gets to live into eternity but by me. That's a Galloway paraphrase. Normally paraphrases are shorter. This one needed to go a little bit longer for whatever reason. Thirdly, the promise is infinitely better than the law because it's chronologically founded. God gave the promise before the law. In fact, again, I argue before the foundation of the world. He gave the promise. He confirmed the promise. And guess what? He's going to keep the promise. And you know what his next promise is? That he's coming back again. I keep hoping that one day when I do that, we're all just going to start going. I really want to be like in that moment. Christ is coming back and then just disappear. That would be so awesome. I'll work on it. And fourth and finally, the covenant of the promise, so much better, infinitely better than the covenant of the law because it is complete. It is lacking nothing. And therefore, it is upheld by the death, burial, and resurrection and the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait for that. Even so, Lord, come quickly. And you might think this is backwards, but that leads us to the title of today's message, which is Why the Law? That was the introduction. Are y'all ready? No? Okay, well, we'll cut it off here. We'll come back next time. So that today's message is called Why the Law? Why the law? And that's where we'll begin next time in verse number 19. You see, why the law then? And Paul's argument here, his thought, is if the promise is that good, if the promise is that complete, if it is that fundamentally sound, if it is resting on the cornerstone of Christ, then why the law in the first place? Right? I mean, isn't that the next logical question? If the promise is this good, then why do we need the law? Right? Why Sinai? Why did you have to tell people not to kill other people? It seems like it should be pretty self-evident. If you keep killing people, guess what? We're not going to be here anymore. It seems like it would work itself out. So why then the law? So when we come back next week, we'll conclude this two-part message and answer the question, why the law in light of the promise? Why the law in light of the promise? It's a great question. If you want the answer, you'll have to uh, come back next week or be raptured. beforehand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, wow. We stand in absolute amazement. The promise of an inherited blessing is too good, and it is only ours through faith. Father, we ask now that you would give us that faith. Give us the faith to stand in the fold and to proclaim unashamedly the glories and the splendors of your word to the world. Renew our minds now in this moment and moment by moment as we go that our thoughts would be continually on you. And God, I pray right now that you would renew in us a commitment to following Jesus Christ our Lord and to understanding why it is that we follow you in the first place. Lord, it is because you have saved our souls from something so unimaginable and continue to do it to this day. Give us, Lord, not a blind faith, but a faith of perseverance and a faith of understanding rooted in your word as we seek to glorify you through its exposition time in and time out as we come before your throne. Lord, we pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.